This video is going to be different than your typical care sheet video. I want to emphasize this isn't a care sheet. This is my philosophy. This is why I do the things I do. This is how I approach every single reptile I own. Now let me back up real quick and give you a little history on me so you can see where I'm coming from. Now I'm not some type of expert. I don't have 5 million animals. I'm just somebody who's been passionate about these things for a long time. When I was younger, we used to get a lot of wild caught animals and it was really hard to keep them. There's certain tricks and stuff that I learned to keep them alive. I'm a new breeder to ball pythons. I got boas. I got some things in here that I really enjoy. Now, while I'm new to snakes, I'm not new to reptiles. I've had lizards since I was a kid. I've had so many lizards. I've bred bear dragons and chameleons and leopard geckos and all sorts of things. So I have a lot of experience with lizards. I don't have a lot of experience with snakes, but my philosophy applies to everything, given the room. When I approach a reptile, I don't approach it thinking that I know what's best for the animal. I approach it like I don't know anything about the animal. The animal's the expert. The animal knows everything. All I try to do is give it everything it needs to survive. What I mean by that is I offer it choices, whether it's humidity, heat, hides, um, darkness, light, like you name it. I try to put as much as I can in the spectrum. I try to let them pick and choose what they want when they want it, instead of me deciding what they need when they need it. So basically this philosophy is that I'm not an expert, the animal's the expert. When I try to set up an enclosure, I try to set up an enclosure that will allow for all of the basic life events to happen within it. I don't want to have to add things or take things away in order for things for basic life events to happen. Now, obviously there's cons to this type of setup, which I'll get into later, but animals will truly thrive in these environments. I'm going to show you my tegu's enclosure only because I'm in the process of, a, well, I'm about to start building his new enclosure. While I have this uh, enclosure set up, I think it's a perfect time to show you guys because this particular enclosure will actually work for a lot of things. A little bit of variations, maybe a better lid, but like ball pythons, leopard geckos, beer dragons, like Euromastics, garter snakes. I mean, a lot of things can live in this style of enclosure. Okay, so let's go meet Brody and see his enclosure. All right, so this is Brody's cage. Um, don't make fun of the top. This was temporary. I was fully committed to not spending a single dollar on this top because I knew it was just gonna be temporary. We're actually building his new cage here and it's gonna be massive. Eight feet, maybe a little bit more and uh, pretty high. So that cage is gonna be permanent. I have to actually do work around here first. I have to paint the walls, I have to redo the floors, I have to put new windows down here because once this thing's in here, I'm not gonna be able to get in. So it's a pretty big project. I've been dreading it, but you gotta do what you gotta do, right? So, all right, so this is the top. The top, it's, it's pretty basic. I have weights on it because he's strong. He climbs up on everything, just pushes himself right out. He actually escaped like the second day I had him when he was little. The top's just set up where the heat and humidity will hit the top. And then there's a couple holes here in a crack, but, and then there's a gap in here, and then there's gaps actually underneath where it can come out. So there is airflow. The problem with, with uh, the problem with setting up enclosures is airflow. Airflow is one of the most overlooked aspects of reptile husbandry. And I'll get into that a little bit more later. But I'm gonna take the top off and we're gonna dive in. Okay, so the inhabitant of this enclosure is Brody. Brody is, I think he's like nine months old now. He's a Chacoan Tegu. Um, he's a sweetheart. He's a little skittish, he's a little shy. He comes out, you can hold him. He prefers to be on your shoulder. All right, so this is a galvanized horse trough. It is uh, four feet by two feet by two feet. It, um, it's great because it can actually hold water, so we won't have to, we won't have to worry about rusting or anything like that, which is important when you have this much moist dirt in here. Now the dirt is just a mix of different things. It's got peat moss, um, topsoil, sand, uh, probably some dirt from outside. I don't know, it's been, it's, it's a lot of different things. Um, what I try to do is I try to make it so it's like, it could hold a, bur a burrow pretty good if you dig, um, but you don't want it to be soaking wet on top at all times. Um, it's about, I'd say about, it's probably about a foot deep, but he's always pushing it around and moving it. So it's probably deeper in spots, lower than others. Uh, he does burrow. I find that a lot of animals will burrow. What I do is I, I mix it together and then I start playing with it. And I decide whether I need more peat moss or the dirt or whatever it is, or sand, to make it how I feel. And how I feel about the type of dirt is subjective. It's just something I, I can't explain. It's just, I, I go like this. I, I clump it up. I'm like, ah, this thing holds a burrow pretty good. And that's about it. I don't want it collapsing on them. I don't want it to sit there and stay wet forever. Uh, after what I usually do when I, I add water to this, to the dirt, is I think torrential downpour. I don't think 
um, a little bit of misting or rain, I take like um, pitchers of water and I just pour it in, flood the place. And then it'll soak in, it'll be soaked and wet in here for a few days, but then it'll dry out. And then what I'll do is once I put my finger in here, it's like an inch or two down is dry, then I'll add more water. It usually takes like a week or two or two or three, depending on the season. And the lighting over here, I have UVB. I have two 38 watt halogen flood bulbs. I have two of them to make it larger because he's large. Um, it also provides a decent heat gradient. And then these things right here are called, uh, I think they're called Redis stacks. This guy, Frank Redis, if I'm saying his name right, he is the one who made them popular. It's usually spread out more, but he pushes everything around. Actually, I have a bunch of them. And when you make these things, you can make them any way you really want. You can literally just line the enclosure, the whole thing with it if you really want. And the idea is to make wood stacks so that they, the animal can go in there. He can hide, they can hide in all the cracks and crevices. Um, there's different levels of humidity. So if you go in here, say by the dirt, it's gonna be more humid. If you go by the, the heat, it'll be hot, humid, hot, dry, depending on where the animal wants. Also, I like to use these little thinner pieces of wood. They're like uh, oak or, or birch or something. And the reason being is that when it heats up, the inside will actually be warm too. So he can go under the top layer and get heat, which is nice. And just options. This whole, this whole enclosure is all about options. So to tie this whole thing together, what I do is I take these bulbs, which are 38 watt halogen flood bulbs. And uh, the reason why I like them is they're low wattage. They um, put the heat in an, in an area. And they don't, they're not like high watt, 150 watt bulbs that heat up the air around it. And the reason why I don't want the, the air around like 110 degrees, I just want the hot spot, is what these heat lamps do is they shoot heat down. They heat up the area, but they also heat up the air. They heat up um, everything around it. They absorb the moisture and then they turn around and take that heat and moisture right outside your tank. So the heat comes down, sucks up the moisture, and then comes right back up and is replaced by cold air. That's an issue, right? That's definitely an issue. So, so, so to band-aid that, what you gotta do is you have to have high watt bulbs that just pump, 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 pump heat. But the problem with that is that those high watt bulbs are, create, are sucking up even more moisture and then releasing it even faster. Now the air, not only do these things take the moisture out of your animal, they take it out of the soil, they take it out of the water dish, they take it out of everything. That's why the top has to be mostly solid because you don't want it just to come up. You want it to get trapped and you want it to circulate. Ideally, you'd want like the room this enclosure is in to be like say 75 degrees and semi-humid or whatever, because this way you could have more airflow. But the problem is in places, especially like, like me in New York, like in the winter time, is it's so dry down here that the air just sucks this environment, including my animal, dry, it desiccates them. So I have to constantly combat the airflow. So what I want to do is I want to have enough airflow where the animal is good, but not, but not so much where it dries them out. And I don't want to have, have it so stifling in here that mold and stuff grows either. Now airflow is important because you want nice clean oxygen. The animal themselves actually don't need all that much oxygen. Like a lot of times they'll go into the burrows and then seal it shut so you can't even get into it. And they can stay like that. They can hibernate like that. It's like it's amazing, it really is. But you still want fresh air in here. Ideally, in my opinion, uh, the better setups have the vents, the air vents on the sides somewhere lower. This way the heat stays up in the top and the humidity and then actually you can condensation can build on top if you need to be or whatever. And then it'll, you can control it so you can increase or decrease the airflow depending on the time of year. These Rita stacks are really are really are valuable. It's almost like cork bark or anything like that really is great for the animals. Because what happens is a lot of times these animals, to feel secure, they like to wedge themselves into things. So when you have these things at angles, they can actually wedge themselves in so their back belly and everything's touching. And the more insecure they feel, the tighter they can get themselves. Also, when you have enough of these in here, that um, the level of darkness is completely up to him too. So if he wants to be in pitch black, he can be. If he wants to be out in the light, he can be. It's like he has so many options. And like I said before, not only that, like it could be 150 degrees right here, but then it could be 130 underneath it and he's still getting heat. It could be 70 down at the bottom of this thing. It could be you know, 75, 80 on this side. It could be dry over here. It could be humid over here. And that's what I was saying before about giving these animals options. Because what happens is, during their life and their needs change. 
And if you don't, if you just have them say 80, say 95 degrees here, 75 degrees here, they don't have all the options all the time. And I think that's a problem. I think that's a, I think that's a mistake, honestly. Like I said before, I don't know what this animal needs. I'm not an expert. The animal is the expert. So what I try to do is I just try to give him every possible condition I could possibly can and make this space as usable as possible. And then just, and just sit back and let the animal do what he does best. It's great about this environment, like I said before, about um, having all these basic life events is that you, he can or she can um, eat, sleep, hibernate, lay eggs. I mean, you name it. I don't have to add or take away from this. I used to have more of those stacks in there, but he's just too big and he just pushes everything around too damn much at this point. He can't fit into anything anymore. He really needs a bigger enclosure. I think a mistake a lot of people make when they get an animal is that they will go on to um, the internet and see where it lives and say, okay, well, it's average is 85 degrees and 40% humidity. Therefore, you give them 80 degrees, 85 degrees, and you know 40% humidity or something like that. And I think that's the wrong way of looking at it. I don't. Most of these animals, especially ones that come from more semi-arid or arid environments, they seek out micro environments in order to thrive in those harsh environments. And things like these burrows are those micro environments to be cooler, more humid, more secure. I think a lot of the problems people have with things like um, metabolic bone disease, parasites, dehydration. Everything, it all stems from how you set up the enclosure. A good enclosure can really, really take care of most of the issues that you're going to come across. I say most because you know, things happen, especially if you have large collections. Your probability plays out. Sometimes I'll see pictures of these large enclosures, like the size of a room. And uh, what's great about those is you have space. The animal can move. And if you have something from a climb on, he can climb. So there's all sorts of activities there. But where they fall short is... The to have one basking temperature at one position and that's it. So the room is the same temperature, the whole entire room, the humidity is the same, and he has a warm spot. So he has a lot of space, but he doesn't have a lot of usable space. He could just literally pace. And then the floor to ceiling, unless there's like a tree in the middle or something, there's really, there's nothing he can do with any of that space. In situations like this, especially with more terrestrial animals like this, when you have this much dirt or even more, two feet of dirt, whatever, they can use all of that, every square inch. And depending on the species, like um, Ackies and, um, Ackies take little monitors, even bearded dragons will use it. Uh, they can be quite busy. Like, like you can see here, like he's always digging. Also, what's great about this enclosure, or an enclosure similar to this, you can make a few adjustments and put like Ackies in here or a lot of different type of monitor lizards, a lot of different type of like, um, like spiny tail lizards or, or pretty much anything terrestrial, semi-arid would be perfect for this. A little, a little bit of uh, changes and you can make it more tropical. I mean, you could have colony of leopard geckos in here. Like I said before, garter snakes. You could have ball pythons. I mean, you just add enough of these wood stacks in here. You add enough of these wood stacks in here, and it's like, you know, it's wood piles. You could put 10 more of these things in here, and the whole top could be these wood piles, and it's just cracks and crevices, and I mean, just plenty of places for animals to hide and secure, and it's almost like if you went outside and you were digging through a wood pile looking for snakes. Like, that's what you're creating in here. Now, we'll, we'll see Brody. Uh, let's see if we get big Brody. There he is, big fat head. This guy is always hungry. I fed him already today, but he is always hungry. He acts like he hasn't eaten in a long time, and he acts like if he doesn't eat at this second, that he's going to die, like all the time. But his appetite perfectly reflects his growth rate. Uh, he eats like a beast and grows like a beast. I mean, he's nine months old. He's got to be three feet already. He's not hibernating, so I'm assuming he's gonna get even larger. Also, with the dirt, if you want, you can do what's called a cleanup crew. You get like roly polies and like little bugs and stuff, and these isopods, or, and they'll actually clean up any of the little bit of food that he doesn't eat or poop or whatever you don't get, and it makes it bioactive, and it makes it so that even if he goes to the bathroom, you pick it up, it doesn't even smell in here. It's not like a carpet or something where it'd stink if he went to the bathroom on it. This is Brody. I call him Brody because he walks like he's brolic. I just took him out from underneath those boards, and he's warm because those boards heat up, so underneath the board is warm. So it's almost like he's still basking while hiding. My goal of this video wasn't to show you a big fancy or extravagant enclosure. It was to show you a very simple, easy to do enclosure that's actually better for these animals than like something that, like with like, repta carpet and one hotspot. And it's amazing what you learn from these animals when you stop thinking you know everything. If you like this video, do me a favor, like it, subscribe to my channel, follow me on Instagram and Facebook and Snapchat and TikTok and everything. I'd really appreciate it.
and uh, thanks for watching.